All right, everyone. So maybe you've heard this phrase before. Stop me if you have. You may need a budget. <laughs> In fact, you need a budget. Now, now this is a point of debate for some people, but I think for many of us at some level, we know that it's true. It's no, even if we may not do the exact thing that someone else does, we need a version of a budget and we may not even have the language to describe that need. But in the background, there's a level of stress, not knowing what money is coming in, what's going out, what our obligations are. We look at our checking account and regardless of the size, we feel stress. And I think that is going to make this episode incredibly attractive, both for myself as someone that feels like they need those guardrails and someone like Brad who says, I've never used a budget. I don't understand the need for it. Why would you even do that? I think this is going to be fantastic. And what we did is we've reached out to Jesse, uh, Jesse Meekham, who is the founder of You Need a Budget. He has helped hundreds of thousands of people exactly that, establish a budget in their lives. And they created a software to serve those individuals. The company started back in 2004, now has over a hundred employees. And I actually remember an article back like in 2013, 2014, and it was on one of these mainstream media sites. And it said, you need a budget. Is this the best company in the world to work for? Making the case, which is kind of cool. But anyways, I'm really excited to dive into Jesse's story, bring a little bit of information and insight to our community, talk about this incredibly popular budgeting tool. And also to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing quite well. And yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to this, especially because what you said, I have this narrative in my own head that, oh, I've never used a budget. I'm not a budgeting person. I'm not sure what value I'd get, et cetera, et cetera. You know all the excuses. But I'd like to think that I'm open-minded enough to ask questions, learn more about it, and see if this is something that I might get value from. So selfishly, I, I think this should be great for me. And it's interesting that you and I are so very different on the budgeting scale. Like that is something that you do, you've always done, and you plan to always do. So with that, Jesse, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead. And I, I, wanna, I really want to go back to, you're the founder of this company, but I believe you're an accountant. So let, 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 let's talk about that. No, this is, no. Is that I'm not true? I'm a recovering. I'm a recovering. <laughs> Re recovering accountant. Okay, you and good. me both, my friend. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> let's recovering accountant. Fair enough. But but you're not a software guy, right? Like like on day one, when you start this thing, if you go back to the early days of this, what we, we have this wine app, this incredibly popular budgeting tool. What was this in 2000, you know, in 1998? What, what are we talking about then? Yeah, uh, it, it, the original piece of software was uh, what I built for me and my then fiance, now wife, Julie. And so I, I literally took, um, you know, I was in, I was in the accounting track and I took a class called ISIS 100 and they taught you how to use spreadsheets. And I remember thinking, that's pretty handy. Like, you know, you can add cells up, up and down and across. And, uh, and then when we got engaged, I realized we were both really poor. And when you combine two poor people, it, there's nothing synergistic about that. You're still just poor. <laughs> uh, and so I thought well, we should be careful. And, um, and I'd just been learning this Excel stuff and I thought, well, this, this is the thing you'd use to kind of track your finances. And this, you, you know, you got to remember this is back before the app store and things just kind of ready made for you anytime you Googled. So I just built us a little spreadsheet and uh, we got married. We started using it. And, um, it worked really well. And then when we were about to have our first baby a year later or so, that was when I thought I need extra money. Still the budget was working, but we had an income problem. And that was what made me think maybe I could sell this spreadsheet. So I wasn't, I didn't have grand plans. I didn't, I wasn't an entrepreneur. I was in the masters of accounting program, just heads down. You know, I was going to make my career in accounting. And, uh, so I just, I kicked it off as like a little side gig. And I'm glad that I thought of it as a side gig because it helped me feel like I could do it. I didn't have to conquer, you know, suddenly bring in $10,000 of, of revenue a month or whatever. I actually had to bring in $350 per month to make it through school without having to borrow any money. So it was a very doable goal and that's how we got started. Jesse, what did that first version of this spreadsheet look like? I, I'm trying to imagine like- it's horrible. Yeah, no, I, I I can only imagine. Like, I, I I create spreadsheets all the time. Like, he has shared those spreadsheets. Yeah, they are horrible. They are, they are awful. I feel bad for anyone that has to interpret yeah. it. <laughs> but also, I so I would like to hear a little bit about that. But what made you have this idea that you could sell this thing? Like, again, I create spreadsheets all the time. I don't have any concept that someone would pay a I dollar to even look at. It. I wouldn't pay you a dollar. <laughs> I would pay you a dollar not to look yeah. at it and then tell me what it says. Well, 
There, there's actually a pretty interesting lesson there that I picked up early. I asked a friend who had done a little bit of internet marketing early, early stuff. And, and I said, Hey, I have this spreadsheet. It's pretty good. I think, you know, of course. And, uh, you think I could sell it? And he said, yeah. And I Googled around and I found one other place online that was selling spreadsheets. So I thought, well, they're doing it. And I, you know, I don't know if they're making money, but there was a web page up. So I listed it for nine ninety five, and my target again, 350 bucks a month. So I thought I got to sell a little over one a day so that we can make rent essentially and, and stay ahead of having to borrow money for school. And, uh, I didn't sell any, you know, and that was back. Google AdWords was new and everything was five cents a click, super cheap. So I could test it a little bit. I had about $63 that Julie and I had decided was kind of our test fund for it. Like, we're going to see if this works. And I was running ads uh, on AdWords way back and <laughs> five cents a click was glorious. And nobody was buying. And I chatted with my buddy and he said, it's priced too low. Nobody's going to buy it for, for 10 bucks. So he said, double it. So I, it was a buy now button on PayPal. If you guys remember those. And, um, I, I dropped a one in front of the nine and it was now 1995. And I dropped in that new JavaScript code or whatever it was. And I got my first sale about 24 hours later and, uh, it didn't change anything else. And so that has always stuck with me that sometimes like what you're saying, you know, Brad, you're saying, well, I, I would never think to sell it. And because you're the creator, you know, you undervalue it and, um, it's just natural. And so sometimes we have to kind of, uh, put ourselves out there and be a little egotistical with it to think maybe this would actually add value for someone else. Just a little bit of ego, hopefully not too much. Um, and then, you know, and then, yeah, put it out there. So at 1995, it started selling little, little bits. But it sold enough that a year later when somebody came along, Taylor, who's my business partner and CTO, you know, he came along and said, I could make you real software. I jumped at it. And and from there, it started really being meaningful. Jesse, I wanted to ask about the $63 in ad, AdWords yeah. uh, funds that you allocated. So, I mean, do you ever think back on inflection points and say like, all right, small sample size, even at five cents a click, right? What yeah. happens if I got no sales? Would you have... Would you have closed up shop at that point? Was that was that sixty three dollars make or break at that? That's such an odd amount, you know. It, yeah, it that was all we me, had. Like we had yeah. literally budgeted for it, you and, know? and that's that was all we that, had. and that's what I'm hearing. Like it strikes me as such a crazy amount, but but that that was a make or break amount of money for you then. Like, what would have happened if you mm -hmm. got no sales? Do you suspect? Yeah, I, I would have definitely stopped. It, I would have just. I, I was. There's an interesting situation and i've thought a lot about this more recently where um we have non-negotiables right and a lot of people haven't really decided what their non-negotiables are and i think that's a missed opportunity one of my non-negotiables i had two one was i wasn't going to borrow money for school i credit dave ramsey for that i read his book when i was like 14 financial peace university my dad handed it to me he's like you should read this i read it of course i liked it because i'm apparently wired for that and I read that he said, you shouldn't borrow money. So fast forward, I don't know, eight years later, and I just didn't even enter my mind that we should. So that was one non-negotiable. The other one was Julie really, once this baby came, Julie really wanted to quit her job. She was making 12 bucks an hour working for the state as a social worker. And uh, she wanted to quit and wanted to just do the mom thing full time, right? And I was all in on that. So we had these two things that we're, we were not going to compromise on. And the thing that gets me is I only needed 350 bucks a month for two and a half more years. So we're, we're talking about seven grand for a master's degree in accounting where I knew I'd get a job. And that sounds downright reasonable. If I were to go to anyone anywhere and be like, I need to borrow $7,000 to finish up a master's degree and get a job where I have really good prospects, everyone would have said, yeah, that's, that's totally fine. So I was, but for me, it wasn't reasonable. And that was why, that was what was the push where I could say, I'm just going to try and make this up. And uh, there are so many other directions I could go, but having, having something where you say, I'm not going to budge, that's when the creativity starts to come out. And if I had just used the escape hatch of borrow a little money, or maybe have Julie work part-time or whatever it was, there were all these other levers we could have pulled, but we, we didn't. And that caused Julie and I to come up with another solution. And I feel people, like people sell themselves short on their creativity and their drive and their will when they can just easily step past having zero dollars into a little bit of debt just to get them by. 
it's not because I hate debt, uh, you know, on its own, but I feel like it does do people a disservice in that way. Um, I don't even know if I answered your question, Brad. No, that's that, great. Though. <laughs> in that way, but um, but yeah, that was an inflection point. I have I have another um more interesting inflection point, which was six months after we'd launched, where I did the profit and loss for the month of February, and we had made thirty eight dollars in profit. And I was working at the time as an intern for a big accounting firm making uh, 30 bucks an hour, which at, might as well have been $1,000 an hour. We, it was amazing. We were actually making real money. And I remember uh, sitting there staring at that P&L thinking, should I just stop this? I mean, this internship, we're going to make good money. I was trying to work as much overtime as I could. And uh, for any, you know, whatever reason, I felt like we should just keep pushing through with it. So it was a little tiny thing. It wasn't taking up tons of time and I stuck with it. But I, re- I distinctly remember debating in that moment, like, come on, 38 bucks. Is this really worth it? So those, those times sometimes scare you when you look back a little bit, but that was one for sure. Yeah. I mean, the last like five minutes or so, I mean, the story you've been laying out for us is so powerful. I really hope that people actually go back and listen to that again and, and really think, you know, what is it that you're not willing to compromise on and what creativity will that release because you're willing to say, Hey, the answer is not necessarily just going to be borrow more money or spend up to your eyeballs. Yeah, I'm not going to take yeah. the easiest path necessarily. Right. I'm going to inject some creativity into here. I, I want to actually you in the last, I don't know, 15 odd minutes that we've been talking or so have said, we close to 20 times. Like, you know, my spouse and Mm -hmm. I, it's clear that you and Julie were on the same page and you were on the same page when it was tough. And you were on the page, same page for every step of this journey. And starting with that, we were poor. And when you take two poor people to put them together, you're still poor, right? Like like, we set aside $63 and use that. And so even when like you have this vision that you don't even know if it's, it's, if it could come true, but she has even less to go on, you know, because you're an ambassador for this idea. And You're whatever right. confidence you don't have about yourself, she, you know, may or may not have as well. There's a lot of dynamics there and there's not a lot of margin to work with. There's $63. Like, let's talk mm-hmm. about the dynamics between you and your spouse and the role, the budget played that actually allowed you to then lean into this when it was really risky. I mean, the 63 bucks could have been used a bunch of different ways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we would have definitely not been on the street, you know, had we lost it all. We didn't have to borrow for anything. Um, it was, you know, I, I, I still am very risk averse and Julie is as well to her credit. Uh, I mean, I, I could, we could go on for hours and hours, but one thing that she did for me that she did two things that were really important. One was after Porter was born my first, he, uh, you know, I launched a few months later and I had this brand new baby and Julie's a brand new mom. I'm a brand new dad, but I had this new business as well. This tiny little business. And I remember just cracking open this big fat Dell laptop because they were all fat back then. And I would, st- I would stick it on our, on our table. We had this old card table my parents had, and I would be working on it all the time, any free moment. And Julie one time was like, Hey, do you want to go for a walk? Let's go for a walk. So we, we put Porter in the stroller, we go for a walk. And, uh, she, we'd been married, you know, a year and a half. We're still like newlyweds at this point, but we have this other person now. So there was, there was some more dynamics. And, uh, She's like, Hey, let's stop for a moment. And I distinctly remember her telling me, listen, you are a dad as well now. So like you, you have to make sure that you balance being a dad, you balance our relationship and you balance this thing that you're clearly very interested in. And she said, but if it, if this thing means that you won't be there for us, then I want it to stop. And that, that was that. And it's one of those times where you have a spouse, you love them, you trust them. Sometimes you you'll disagree and that's normal, but every once in a while they'll say something and it's like, you just know they're right. You just, you feel it. It's instantaneous. It's like soul to soul. And in that moment, I knew she was right. And that has steered me toward just always being able to have her, um, check me at times and, uh, rein me in on that balance. And that's been one of the biggest advantages that we've had as far as working together is I've, She's always been an advisor in that way. Like, hey, she gets to the essence of things and says, hey, like pull back a little bit or hey, this has gotten a little crazy. And I've appreciated that um, more than more than she'll probably ever know. Um, so that's one aspect of it. And the other one that you guys may want to get into or not, I'm not sure. Um, but she has always been totally fine living within our means. So when I blew, you know, we were living in a house with zero furniture in it, brand new house. Well, not brand new, but new to us, zero furniture. And, uh, 
I blew like 80 grand on a software project that I completely scrapped a month before we were to launch it. And I, I remember going to her and like my voice is echoing in this house because it was a good sized house, no furniture, wood floors, everything's echoey. And uh, told her like I had to scrap the project and to her credit, and this, this has been key all along, to her credit, she uh, never once said anything negative about it. She just says, man, that must be tough. And never use it as a bludgeon, never as you have has used my mistakes as some kind of I told you so or you should have seen this coming. And so when you have someone like that in your corner that's just like, hey, I know you're trying as hard as you can, and I know things won't always go our way, my word. I mean, what else could I ask for? You know? So she knows I make mistakes, but I also know that she has my back at the end of the day. And I've, you know, there have been mistakes far beyond that one too. And they've it's fine you know? And so when I put things on the line, I know I'm not putting myself on the line in her eyes and man, it's liberating. Um, and that's on the same page for me. That's, those have been like the game changing attributes of Julie that, that I just, I'm so grateful for. Yeah. That level of support is invaluable. I mean, I can hear yeah. obviously the emotion and sentiment in your voice, and and I'm curious, did you guys at at the very start? So so many people are trying to get that motivation or that inspiration to have these tough conversations with their significant other or their spouse, and I'm curious, yeah. did you guys at the outset of your marriage, did you have conversations about your financial future, about your views on money, on budgeting, on things like this, your plans, your goals? Were those overt conversations, or did it just kind of evolve? They, they were very, very, um, frequent, I would say. And one of the things when, when people say they don't want to budget or Brad, you're like, I've never budgeted. We can take issue with that later and totally unpack that. It'd be fun, but let's unpack that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, 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 at some point we will for sure. But, um, I have a, I have a get out of jail free card when people say they don't budget. Like I, yeah, just save budgets. it, save and reserve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'll get going and it, we won't be able to stop me, but, um, the, the thing is we started out by saying we're going to record every single dollar we spend manually in this spreadsheet. So one is we're going to be like right on top of this. Uh, number two is when we have money, we're going to sit down and allocate that money together. You can't help but talk about the fact that you both think little Caesars once a month for five bucks is a good idea, but anything beyond that is not a good idea. I didn't have to say, I think we should be frugal. I didn't have to say, I think we should cut back here or there. All I had to say was, hey, we have $900 and 350 of it goes to rent. We lived in this horrible little hole, but it, you know, we lived. So we had this extra money and we just said, what does this money need to do before we bring in more money? And that kind of conversation uh, should just happen regularly. And it's not about we should do this, we should do that. But it's like, what do we want this hard-earned money to do? That if, I mean, people will have career conversations all the time. They're like, honey, what do I want to do? I want to get a raise. I want to do this. Should I try and go for this promotion? Should we move to take this opportunity? All these conversations. But yet once the, once the career has been converted into currency, then it's like, oh, we can't talk about it anymore. Like it's, we're talking about the same thing still. We're talking about your life, you know? So I don't get it. I don't get why people have this hang up where once it becomes money, oh, suddenly it's just taboo. It's all still just what you want. You know, so my word that yeah. that person's your, the biggest person in your life. Like, of course you should talk about what you want all the time. I love that frame. And it does, it does seem so obvious when you frame it like that, but I want to, I want to frame it differently just for a second. Yeah. Cause you and Julie are on the same page. You know, you are on the same page. You're on the same team. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us know at some level we should be on the same team, but sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Right. And some of why maybe, maybe sometimes you hear this idea, this huge idea. And you go from this drift state to, I want to plan for my money. And you go home with that crazy look in your eyes, like, we are going to fix everything tonight. We're going to get started on a plan. We're going to implement a plan. We're going to do this. And your spouse on either side looks at you like you have developed that third head, right? And oh. then you try, you realize that you went a little too crazy too fast. And you try to, you try to dial it down a little bit, but it's almost like, I don't know how to restart this conversation because they can't unsee the crazy. And so I'm just yeah. curious when someone, so I know someone's listening to this and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, they, they heard me. So I'm just yeah. curious because I know that wasn't your story, but at the same point, 
as a result of having developed this and, you know, with software, you're trying to get closer to your customer. You're trying to get closer to their needs and you see this. I mean, YNAB is a software, but it's also a community. I've seen that you guys have done a remarkable yeah. job building a community around this. And I know that you see those stories come up. And so with that in mind, even though you can't pull from your own marriage as much for this, I still think you can talk about the patterns. What works? You're trying to get your spouse yeah. or your partner on board. You bring home this idea of a budget or just having a plan for your money, goals for your your life, your financial picture. How do you not scare your partner off? Yeah, that's a yeah. I've scared Julie plenty of times, you know. And we we've had we've had throwdowns about money specifically, and it's because we did not understand what the why behind what we were talking about. There one that plagued me. And I'm, I'm, this is not hyperbole. It plagued us for 10 years. We would agree on an amount for groceries. And by agree, it probably was more like Jesse would say a suggested amount and Julie would be like, okay, you know what I mean? And not a lot of pushback from her. Um, one thing is she's not as interested in budgeting as I am. She's not in, as interested in sitting down and doing the numbers. And if it's a spreadsheet, she's not going to even look, you know? So we're, I, I kind of do it all. And then I show her like, now I want your input. She doesn't have to do the tedious part. I'll do that. So groceries was one. And for years, a decade, we always overspent in groceries. And uh, it bothered me. I was like, the, the budget tells us that we shouldn't. What's going on? But in our the way we've shaken out you know, household responsibilities, Julie does like 95% of grocery spending. So there's a little bit of dynamic there where it's like one person saying, hey, why are you overspending? And that's not always comfortable. One day, finally, we, we at the time, I think we had four kids. Uh, and she just said, Jesse, for me, grocery, grocery shopping is successful if I get into the store and get out without one of the kids melting down. And I don't care about coupons. I don't care about price matching. I don't know what a can of corn costs anymore. Cause I'd said that you used to know what a can of corn costs, you know, <laughs> she's like, I don't know. I don't, she goes, I don't know what anything costs anymore. I just get the stuff, get out of there. And it would, for her, there was this value attached to the experience, right? That it was efficient. And I don't mean financially efficient. I mean, efficient the way she was making it efficient and that was valuable. And then suddenly I thought we need more money in groceries. So we bumped it up quite a bit, several hundred bucks. Um, and we've never gone over since. So I say that because sometimes that the first thing you do to get to your question, Jonathan, is you don't talk about money for like the first three conversations. It's not about money. It's just about wants, dreams, desires, aspirations. And you can talk about those for a long time without ever, you know, mentioning money. And so you start to get to the why on things. And then at some point down the road, I have a few tactics, but at some point down the road, you can say, you know, I really want us to be able to go on this vacation or I want us to be able to do this thing. Try and choose something really positive and awesome. Um, how could we, how can we make it happen with the finances? How can we do this? So just pick one goal, one thing, make it not about spending less, make it about spending more. And have it be established because you've had great conversations about why you want to go to Cabo or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, that That's the way you get started is you avoid the dollars for quite a while. Um, and and I will say, this is it's a slow process. Julie and I are still learning, you know, as we navigate all this stuff. So be patient with it. I do hear you on the the, the night you come home and you're just jazzed. Like, <laughs> I mean, who, who hasn't had that happen? You know, it's... I've like never that, come home. I've right never come home with too much enthusiasm. I just wouldn't do that. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, a weekly so, occurrence in Jonathan's house, I think. Yeah. She's like, here we go again. <laughs> Actually, she's like, I video I videotaped you last Tuesday. Do you want to review that one first? <laughs> oh, story of my life. Yes. Oh, man. yes. Jesse, when we're talking about kind of these uh, interpersonal relationships and communication, what do you uh, the scenario where Neither people are self-described as math people or spreadsheet people. How, I mean, again, you have this massive community. What do you see those people do as far as actually like delineating the duties for using YNAB or just using whatever tool they use for their finances? Like how did those people get started? 
Yeah. I remember talking with a bunch of creatives, like designers, just very creative, genius people. And I framed it for one who was just like, I'm not a math person. I'm not a numbers person. And I said, but you're, you're so creative. I said, well, I, I try to be right. I said, well, what would you, how would you create? Like, if you just want to unleash your creativity on your financial system, just tell me the outcomes that would happen. And we, we kind of framed it differently where I just, I kind of said, this isn't about you molding to how I like to manually type in a transaction every single morning. You know, this is about like, what would it be for you? How would it be designed? Just design it. And suddenly they could say, oh, well, I mean, perfect outcome. I wouldn't have to think about, and they listed these small transactions. And I thought, oh, that's okay. That's interesting. What could you do for that? And so it was really trying to meet people where they're at. And that's even in our software, you know, as far as talking shop, we, we recognize readily that we have to meet people more where they are and then slowly teach them a better way of thinking about their money. And in the FI space, that's, that's exactly the same case. You got to, when someone's living paycheck to paycheck, you can't talk to them about a 45 or a 90% savings rate or anything even close. You have to talk about something completely different. And so you got to kind of recognize where people are at and then meet them where they're at. Use their words and, and meet them and then just kind of slowly pull them along. But um, one thing that you can do that's really easy is you just don't be granular. That's one thing that helps numbers people, just brass tacks, like don't be granular, just keep it really high level, send the savings off and then you're good. That's your budget. You've sent your savings off and it's out of the picture. So relax. Um, don't track the toothpaste category. You know, well, no one should, but especially <laughs> not those people. So. Well, I, you know, I think this is actually the, the perfect uh, place to actually talk about YNAB. So you have, you give this idea to the creatives. I am, I am this granular numbers guy that's manually typing everything in. And this creative says, ah, <laughs> a true noise. Freaks him out. Right. Yeah. So, there, so then you say, <laughs> perfect. That's exactly, I want I'm trying to create for the people that that, you know, freaks out. What would it look like? And over time you create this beautiful software. It's gone through many iterations, but at its core, it seems like you guys have landed on four rules. And I want to give you the opportunity to talk about those four rules in the context of how they came together and why they're important. But I also want to tie this because I think there's someone in the audience right now that actually like they're not paycheck to paycheck anymore. In fact, they have a pretty significant amount of money in their checking account and they actually should give them some peace, but yeah. they're not getting any comfort out of that. In fact, they just don't know what, what, what that money is supposed to be doing. And it makes them anxious figuring out what to do with it. So I think like if we pivot out to this individual, where do these four rules come from? And then what's the, what's the why of YNAP here? Yeah. The, I mean, the, the why behind it, why everyone needs a budget is that they're spending so much energy earning money and it feels really good when your money lines up with what you actually care about. It just feels really really good. And everyone should have that experience, whether they're making, you know, $40,000 a year or $4 million a year. If your money's lined up with what you really value, that's the piece. Even you can still be in debt. You can still be paying bills. You wish you didn't have to pay, but you know that your money's now doing what you really want it to do. That's, that's the key. So that's, that's our why having people gain control of their money and they can do that without our software. So I, I talk often to people and I avoid talking about our software because I want them to get these rules in place. And it, very briefly, the rules, you give every dollar a job, every single one, because you want people to realize that if they're choosing A, they maybe can't choose as much B. And we don't do that in our heads very well at all. People will say, my mother-in-law's one, she'll say, well, I know what I spend. I said, no, you, you don't. And if you're choosing one, you are always not choosing another. So if you're choosing to blow some money here, then you're choosing to not have some savings over here. And having rule one be always in operation where there's the, those trade-offs, that's where you start to have those values make themselves known. And people say, well, I don't really know what I value yet. Well, that's okay. Just use a zero-based budget. And see if after a while, you don't start kind of favoring some categories over others. What's interesting, we do these debt stories podcasts where we'll interview people that have gotten out of debt. They're super fun. And I, we don't, at YNAB, we don't tell people where to spend their money or where to, what to avoid. 
I mean, we don't tell people really what to do at all. We just tell them to follow that first rule and see what happens. And we interview these people that have paid off a lot of debt. And I'll always ask them, what's one thing you did to help you free up this money to pay off debt? I don't, I don't lead them. I don't give them any kind of a leading question without exception. Every single person we've interviewed so far, and it's probably been 30 or 40, they all say, well, we did cut back on eating out. And I've never once said, at least not in the last 10 years, never once said, oh, you shouldn't eat out that much. I just, that's, it's dumb. It's dumb to eat out that much. Don't you know how much it costs per calorie? You know, blah, blah, blah. You do all, all that math. <laughs> cost we, per calorie, we just don't that's do that. granular. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> part, of our, part of our brand is, is very friendly and very approachable. And so I won't lead in to, you know, lead with that idea. But isn't it funny how often people of their own volition just kind of say, oh, after a while of doing these trade-offs, I don't like spending so much money eating out. No one had to tell them. They just saw it. It was the, the value. I mean, this is Jesse, his own opinion. The value isn't truly there for people. It really isn't. And after you do the trade-offs enough, uh, at least of the 30 people I've talked to, they realize, oh, the value isn't there for me either. So it's not about telling people what they should or shouldn't do. It's about having them practice trading off constantly until they realize what they want to do. And uh, it is strange because there are a lot of commonalities among those people that have realized things, but we don't, we don't, you know, we don't give them any instruction along those lines. So that, that first rule is absolutely key. You take the second rule and you add it to it where you, we say, embrace your true expenses, meaning look ahead to larger, less frequent expenses like Christmas or a vacation or property taxes, break them up into monthly amounts. So then that checking account that's big because the person's maybe doing pretty well, but they're still stressed. The checking account isn't just telling them what is in the checking account because that is all a checking account ever does is tells you the balance. And you think about that. That's very useless information. But if we can break up that checking account into tidy little categories and say, this money is for Christmas in nine months and this money is for tomorrow when you go out to get some sushi, then suddenly people can see you're not just doing trade-offs for the here and now, like, do I want the brown boots or do I want to go out to eat? You're doing trade-offs with, do I want these brown boots or do I want to have a great Christmas? And they're not mutually exclusive, but the math that those trade-offs are still happening for people. And then they're starting to recognize, oh, I do value Christmas more than this impulse purchase. And it's not because you shouldn't buy brown boots. It's just because the person has decided they value one thing over another. And so you take rule one and you're extending it out. You're kind of broadening those trade-offs to include those larger expenses that people very often forget about. And that's when the real magic starts to happen. The third rule is very easy. You just change your mind whenever you want. We call it rolling with the punches. And it's a kind of our escape hatch for people. When they're feeling stressed, when they're feeling like, I can't budget, whenever I budget, it doesn't work. I always overspend. I have to move money around. We say, oh, if you're moving money around, you're actually winning. If you're changing your budget, it means you're making halftime adjustments. You know, it means you're, you're adapting to new information. We would be throwing things at the TV if our favorite basketball coach didn't make appropriate halftime adjustments, right? Or if an offensive coordinator up in the box, you know, for an NFL team wasn't always making adjustments based on new information. But we, when we think budgeting, it's like we suddenly demand that we're clairvoyant, you know? And there was like a B-level movie with Sandra Bullock in it where she could see a little bit into the future. I No one can do that as far as I know. Sandra Bullock you know? has never made a B-level movie in her life. That is true. <laughs> I apologize, Sandra. You are working toward financial independence and are listening to this podcast. But Demolition the, the man, idea anybody? that no. we... <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you really want a trip, you go back and watch The Net, which was like scary internet propaganda and you look at the technology that they're using at the time it's, yeah. it's hilarious so um anyway so that idea of just change your budget whenever you want is awesome it lets people keep going it lets people experience hiccups and think that they're right on track and well not just think know that they're right on track this is part of the part of the plan and then our fourth rule we just want you to build up a little bit of a buffer. Spend money that you didn't earn yesterday. Spend money you earned 30 to 60 days ago. And the, the software calculates it for you. We call it your age of money. But it's in, in reality, it's just like, listen, get yourself some breathing room. You know, if you earned money yesterday, like let, let it live a little before you send it off, you know. Um, and that that's key for people in 
easing them off the, that financial edge and giving them some breathing room so they don't stress so much. It also improves decision making. If you have a, you know, you have an experience that's negative, uh, your car tire blows out. It gives you a little bit of time to not just be so knee jerky in your reaction. And, uh, so that fourth rule is critical. Yeah. I want to make one observation that I think people may appreciate that have tried to do this by hand and that practicing a monthly budget for the vast majority of people is, is messy. Your expenses on a one month basis, you know, like your growth, like, especially the people that get paid maybe bi-weekly. Ah, what do I do? You know, like you're breaking my mind here. Why can't we all agree on the metric, et cetera. Uh, and one thing that is pretty cool that I've appreciated as I've kind of delved into software a little bit is the average monthly expenses that gets populated after a period of like three months. So you may not know, and this is to your point, like you may not know, you're not clairvoyant. That's a, that's a perfect, and you don't know exactly what the, you know, long-term, short-term future is going to hold, but it's really nice to be able to get a, a sense of your averages over time. That's a valuable piece of data. And it is nice that, um, you guys have recognized that and added that in so that if you, you know, you lean in for the first month and then it takes less work the second and the third, although the numbers change, because you ran out of your Costco supplies, right? <laughs> and now you're like, oh, it averaged out. Cool. Kind of cool to see. Yeah. We, we often talk to people and tell them there is no such thing as a normal month ever. And if you look back through just your bank statement, to keep it simple, look back through a credit card statement, you will always be able to point to an, an expense and say, oh, yeah, that one, well, that was kind of an exception. And then the, the month before that, well, that one was kind of an exception. It just goes on and on. It's just, if you're living then your months are not normal. And the quicker you realize that, the quicker you realize that you, your budget is a fluid plan that is always needing to adapt. And that's just part of being alive. Yeah, that second rule, the embrace your true expenses. I love that. I think a lot of people do miss those larger expenses when they think about their month to month budget, right? Like we have, our kids are, because we value this, our kids are in an expensive swim team. And I mean, that costs yeah. a couple thousand dollars. And while it feels like, oh, I'll just, you know, pay it off. And that one time, it's just a one-time thing. When you amortize that over a year, it's a couple hundred bucks a year. And that almost invariably, yeah. that should go into a monthly budget, right? I, I'm curious. Absolutely. So Jesse, this might be uh, two accountants geeking out here, but how far out do you build that, right? So, I mean, do you say, hey, the HVAC system costs 5,000 bucks. It has a 10 year useful life. It's $41 Brad, and 67 cents. Punch. Like, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, for real though. Like, I mean, does that kind of stuff, I mean, th that's insane. I know the answer is probably no, but like how far, you know, from the Christmas, which I understand is, you know, a sub 12 right. month away to like, how far out would you go realistically? Yeah. I uh, go out to a car purchase. So we'll, we, we set aside money for that every single month. Um, I don't do the home, like I don't do a uh, roof repair or things like that. Some people do. That's just, I, I haven't found the value in it. What I do though, to compensate for that is I have saved up, you know, some number of months of expenses that are true, what I would call true emergencies, meaning I did not capture this in, in that idea of a true expense. I did not capture the roof. I did not amortize the HVAC. So I'm just going to have a pile of money here. And when those things happen that frankly, I just don't want to account for, I will pull from that and and go to town. Um, most people, when they start to follow rule two and look ahead to those larger bills, they, they have fewer emergencies and they start to use the word emergency more accurately. So when a car tire blows out, they don't say, Oh my gosh, I had this crazy emergency. I had to replace my tires because I, I don't know. I've never, I am yet to find with, uh, you know, lots of Googling yet to find the t car tires that never wear out. Right. And so People pretend that they will go forever. They behave as if they'll go forever. And then when the car tire blows, they're like, what an emergency. It's just not the case. Um, what happens when you're doing this for a while is your emergency fund ends up just sitting and never is used because you're using rule two and you're looking ahead and you're stockpiling little, very specifically focused piles of money. And then when you need to buy the new car or you need to replace the transmission, it's just it's just normal. It's as close to a normal month as you actually would get, really. And so you drop 1800 bucks on a transmission and life goes on as if it had never happened. And when people first start experiencing that kind of money, you know, you're replacing a dishwasher and you're not having to put it on a credit card. Uh, you know, that's, that's magical because the flip side of that, Brad, is the people that don't foresee it 
They've already done their, should I buy this or should I, shouldn't I? Not including that they'll need to replace car tires. They'll need to do this or that. And so they bought the thing. So they don't have the money. And then when the dishwasher goes out, they're like, oh, woe is me. I, I don't make enough money. You know, I'm, I'm a victim. And they just put it on the card. And there's inch by inch, they put it on the card. Only this one time, this is an exception. This wasn't a normal month. But you put every non-normal month on the card over a period of a few years and people rack up a pretty good amount of debt. So um, rule two prevents that kind of slow debt creep that people don't even realize is happening. Um, but to, for the accountant in you, just, uh, you know, check your materiality threshold <laughs> on things and, you know, touché, go from there. Touche, I like yeah. it. So Jesse, I'm curious, you talked about putting that money aside and, and I get that. It, it sounds like a, like a intermediate term amount of money for for these eventualities, right? They're not crazy. It, this is going to happen, right? So I, I guess I'm I'm curious for for me or for someone pursuing financial independence, do you see that as money that is in like a separate, let's say like online savings account and can be accessed at any time? Could I could I earmark money that I even put in Vanguard and put in low cost index funds? as for that, like, what's the delineation there in your mind or what do you counsel people? Yeah, I, um, well, I, my house is about three years old, so I, I have some horizon there. And if someone, uh, you know, you gotta be realistic about these timelines for these eventualities. What you said was perfect. It will happen. When will it happen? We don't know exactly, but we know that a three-year-old house is going to be different than a 30-year-old house, right? So be careful and consider those things as, as I answer the next part of this question, I looked, I used to keep my kind of just emergency pile, that grobe kind of, I don't know what this will be for, but for these eventualities, it's there. I used to keep it right in my checking account. And, um, it was to give people numbers. It was about 30 grand. Uh, I think that might help them understand what I'm looking at. Um, and the 30 grand would just sit in the checking account earning zero. Right. Um, and it, I noticed that I had never, ever used it in the past eight years. And this was just, this was one guy. And I looked at that. I thought, that's interesting. It's just sitting there and I haven't touched it for eight years. And eight years is, that's a pretty good amount of time to see if you've got good data. And I, so I ended up sticking it in, um, I don't know if I want to plug anything. This is not a plug. Uh, I stuck it in betterment because I knew I could just like crank down the, make it conservative really easily. Um, but you could stick it in so many places. Uh, I stuck it there and, um, literally this morning I looked at it and I had for, uh, this sounds bad. I had forgotten it was there. Um, and just remember this morning. So I logged in and it's grown in the last, I think it's been, maybe been, been there for two years. It's grown from 31,000 is what I put in to 33,000. So, okay, that's good. Um, Nothing's changed, you know. We're we're still eating out the same amount, buying the same amount of clothes. Um, it's readily accessible. It's in a spot that's the optimizer in me likes it there versus the checking account. Um, but I don't have any laser focused guidance because I'd really need to get to know people's budget, where they're, you know, the eventualities they're talking about, what amounts of money we're dealing with. But one guy that does like to over-optimize, he ended up sticking it in a place that earns a little bit of money, you know? Um, and if it were to go down below 30, based on eight years of never having used it, I was okay with that horizon. So Yeah, and it's also interesting. It's one of those classics. No, no, it's really interesting because people talk about, like if you look maybe at like the, the, the Dave Ramsey community that you referenced, the Financial Peace University community, and you look at this yeah. kind of this, this dogma, of, and I say dogma in this case, kind of a little bit slightly lighthearted, but just like the why of this, who are you talking to? This three to six months of savings, it's in a checking account, keep your hands off it, keep your grubby hands off it, don't touch it, don't look at it, forget that it's there. Like if you think about the scenario there, in many cases, the odd, the intended audience for this are people whose 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 finances coming into this show, coming into this concept are, are dumpster fires, like like they yes. are train wrecks. And for you, what's interesting is the 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 farther you get on this path, and you'll find this the the less you actually you need an emergency fund, but the question of where it is and the likelihood that you're going to need it start to become more and more removed. And so I think what I've seen, and and I, and I think a lot of people in our community is 
Yes, you need to be able to have a plan to access money in case of an emergency, but the dogma over where that emergency fund is, you just need to be able to plan for contingency. What are you going to do if the market drops 30%? What are you going to do if you need a $20,000 expense? You know, and so this, this, it has to be in a checking account earning 0.01% and you're never allowed to touch it. It has to be in a savings account earning one, maybe, maybe, but do you have a yeah. plan to accommodate a twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 emergency? What's, what's your plan? Yeah. It's important to be very prescriptive when people are, when something's on fire, right? You, you got to be prescriptive because the person needs a prescription, but as they become a little more, um, stable and as, as the fire's put out and the smoke's cleared, uh, someone that's sitting there telling me, Hey Jesse, I've scraped together 24, 30 grand over the past year or two. Where do I want to put it? At that point, I feel like saying, well, man, you're probably, you know, you're probably pretty equipped to answer that. So Google around a little and find what makes you sleep okay. And if you keep having the thought that you've done something wrong, that probably means you don't like what you did and you should change it a little bit. But I, I like giving people some leash unless they're, unless they're going to fall off the edge. And then I want that leash. Right, I'll, right, I'll yank right. on it, you know, but, um, for a lot of people, I, th I think a lot of people that, that are with us and have been with us for a while, um, you end up being much less prescriptive and more kind of principle based. And this is not a knock at all on, on Dave Ramsey. I, I, that guy does more good. I, I just can't say enough about how much good I feel like he's done in, in his lifetime. Um, and so he knows exactly what he's doing and he know who's, knows who he's talking to and he knows how to get results for that audience. I, I'd never question that, but our audience tends to lean. Uh, I, I think we're a little further along. I mean, the fires may be still there. There's some smoldering. Um, but we have a little bit of room to breathe and maneuver and, uh, and we don't have a radio show where we have to, um, be very consistent. Right. And that also helps us be a little more tailor-made in some cases, give them a little more leash. I hear you, man. All right. And, and great feedback on that. Let me, uh, let me do just a slight pivot here as we kind of get ready for our hot seat. But this is like, this is like one of those selfish serving questions and just for my host. You know, I feel like Brad needs some, some financial guidance. Right? <laughs> I'm <laughs> no, getting thrown under the bus. <laughs> here, gotta be thrown, let's get some bus animations here. This is going to happen. All right. So let's play this out. Brad Barrett, CPA. I have a hundred percent savings rate until I choose to spend a penny. I've never used a budget. I don't personally see the need for a budget in my life. And I think there's probably people in our audience that either identify with that or maybe even use other verbiage like, I don't believe in a budget, I believe in the anti-budget or whatever, you know, pick, pick mm -hmm. a different frame for this. I'm just curious, as the founder of a company called You Need a Budget, what would your response be? Yeah, I'm totally offended. <laughs> and out of the gate, absolutely offended. Yeah. Um, Brad, how do you, give me like a, a one minute version on your finances. Tell me how, I mean, if you can, tell me how things are structured um, I love the idea of it's saved until it's spent. I think that's actually really good heuristic, you know, cause it makes spending it maybe a little harder, but give me a rundown on, on, yeah. What, yeah. How things, no, sure how thing. Things are. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's talk circa a couple of years ago when I had a W2 job. So, uh, I guess my paycheck was direct deposited into our checking account and basically everything flows into and out of that checking account. So, we have our, I guess, utility bills that come out of there. The mortgage gets paid automatically through there. The credit card is set up for auto pay, 100% of statement balance every month. And I, as I've mentioned here on the podcast a bunch of times, I do not have any interest in being stressed out about cash flow timing. So I generally kept a buffer in that checking account of maybe... I don't know, three to five thousand dollars extra. So I'm never, oh no, they didn't pay me on time this month and the electric bill is coming out. What am I gonna right. do? Scramble, 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 right? So for me, yeah. it was uh stress mitigation, really more than anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, honestly, that that is the extent I, at the end of every month, presumably presumably there was money left over. You know, we have a significant savings rate. And that money then was sent to one of whatever investment we had planned for that month, usually yeah. Vanguard or some such. Yeah. So your so your budget, and if I were to if I were to classify it as a budget, your budget was um, broken down into a few things. 
One was this money's job, because we speak about it in jobs. This money's job is to be there so I don't have to worry about timing bills or just mismatches every once in a while. That would be annoying. And I agree there. So this this pile of three to five grand is its job is just to like handle that slushiness for you. Um, the other this another job was for the money to go off to savings. And how did you decide how much you were gonna send? send to savings? Did you look at the end of the month and say, this is now left over, we're going to send it? Or did you send it direct deposit from the employer? How did that look? Yeah. So I guess it was a combination. So no, we never sent directly from the employer to any of our our personal taxable savings. But I guess 401k, of course, you know, I, we yeah. had that that put in automatically. But yeah, I mean, I guess at the end of every month, and, and frankly, I, we were not as as diligent about this as we probably should have been in my perfect world scenario. So I'm going to give you my, uh, my BS answer here is we would have at the end of every month looked at a floor amount that we were comfortable having yeah. at the end of the month. Any amount over that was sent automatically. Now, unfortunately, yeah. stupid human brain gets in the way and muddies it up. Right. So that didn't happen like clockwork, like it should have, but in essence that happened probably every 60 days. Or less. Yeah. Yeah. So you, I mean, you, you have like a, the, one of the simplest budgets that one could have. It's like, I've got saving, I've got spending, I've got this floor money to make sure that I don't, you know, that I don't make, do something annoying. And if there's a big expense one month, the floor handles it. And you had a priority of keeping that floor propped up. If something did hit that would go below, then the next time, you know, you'd build it back up. But you just had this a very simple budget, so simple that managing it in software would probably be overkill, right? Brad, you I mean, had a budget. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we don't. I won't ever tell anyone you did. We can keep saying you never budget. <laughs> just it's between us, secret. Totally just nobody knows. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, but that, I've actually I've kicked around the idea for for Julie and I are, are at this these crossroads where um, we're making enough. And I, I've for finally I've made salary for several years. For a while, it was just it was a roller coaster. Years it was a roller coaster, and um, and Julie would just get very used to me. Um, I would be like, "Sales are great," and she's like, "So?" Because sales being great never ever affected us as a family. I was super careful about keeping that separate. So I, um, you know, there was one year where I, I cut our salary in half. She rolled with that, bless her heart. Um, there was, and I froze it for three years at that half amount, um, because we were piling in for the business and just kept putting chips back in over and over again. And, uh, finally we were able to not always be putting the chips back in. And what that did was it created a salary for us. That's there's plenty of room, probably like what you're dealing with, Brad. It's like, you you know you're living within your means, and that's the case for us. And Julie has found it very uninteresting to optimize some of her spending because she kind of feels like it's a little contrived at this point. And I'm giving you fresh stuff like Jesse in the last four days kinds of stuff. But I I finally did tell her I said you know Julie the game that we used to play of knowing the price of the can of corn of shopping for things used, of just being so penny pinching. Um, that game was valuable to us back then. I mean, it, it was tremendously valuable. We could live within our means and I could keep taking those risks. And I mean, you can't really place value on, on that. So it was very valuable. Now she plays that game and she's like, why am I pretending? Why am I pretending that, you know, price shopping for this is meaningful when materially it is not. And so I've debated just recently, um, the idea of having a much more, uh, much less granular budget and just knowing that I actually will deposit direct to Vanguard, uh, not an endorsement. <laughs> I'll just direct, you know, the pay, like a lot of it just goes directly to, to that account. to the taxable account, 401ks are maxed. And, um, that's that. And we kind of know it's on autopilot and we also could have a floor like you're like you have and just kind of know, yeah, even with, if Christmas pops up, you know, with, with six kids, Christmas is not dirt cheap. Um, and we could have it just be really, really simple. And then this is the key. I could bring Julie in to the holding company that owns YNAB and owns a few rental properties 
And I could say, well, there is still a game that you and I should play, and I don't want to play it by myself. But the game is just up one level. What do we want this money to do? What do we want this business money to do? How do we want to invest this stuff? And so now she's like, oh, thinking about selling a rental property or investing here, now it's back in the day like when we would think about should we get this or that thing and save $4. It's still you're still having to be accountable and thoughtful and intentional with your money. And I want her along for that part of the game, I think. So I like your plan. I think it's good. Um, you're checking off every goal. You're clearly not stressed. It's working for you. I do not think you should use YNAB. Um, and if I see you sign up, I'll delete your, no, I'm just, <laughs> no. All right. So here real quick, I have, I have two small points. Yeah. One is I love in that. I mean, I, I've loved this episode. I've loved this episode. And one of the things you said there is the continuum, right? Like this journey started with knowing the price of that can of corn. Like, I don't want to like, yeah. I don't want to take that off the table and say that wasn't that, that played a role. We're not having this conversation that we're having now. If it didn't start with knowing the cost of that can of corn and knowing the cost of groceries and knowing these different, like, and, and it's cool that if you play that game and you can lean into it as a team, you know, life is not life is a, it's a moving picture. It's not a snapshot where you are right now in this moment is not where you're going to be five years. If you implement these tools now, the conversation is going to grow and it's going to evolve over time. So it's like, it's a kind of a point of encouragement for people. Like the point is not for you five years from now or 10 years from now to be quibbling over a coupons or a can of corn that like, like that completely oh, misses no. the purpose. Right. And then the counterpoint, you nailed this perfectly, but I think we need to like for our audience, we need to keep that in mind is the variable income. That's the only thing we haven't really touched on. You just mentioned it as an entrepreneur, but you got to recognize a lot of our audience, they're, I mean, not everybody is just paycheck employee W2. It's the same thing. Like they're oh, trying yeah. to set a budget and their income is it's feast or famine. And they're talking about three months averages. They're like, I have seasons of life where nothing comes in. What, what do I do? And so I know you got a couple of things you want to tackle, but let me just give that back to you. Yeah. On the variable income piece, um, it would, if you were, if I were to take Brad's example and he would say, but Jesse, there's one more variable you got to throw in here. My income is highly variable. Then I would say, then your floor needs to be bigger, right? You, you, you just have more volatility. So when we are coaching someone through budgeting, one is you do not budget that you do not already have in your hand. And I don't care if you're I used to say a government employee, but then we had that long shutdown. So it ended up being kind of a bad example. <laughs> uh, to work. Like a very reliable <laughs> paycheck, right? A very reliable paycheck. Um, if, let's say you have the most reliable paycheck one could have. Uh, it doesn't matter. Only budget money you have because we want there to be scarcity in those trade-offs with rule one. And if you run out of money in your trade-offs, but then you just say, oh, well, I'll close on that house in two weeks. I'm really sure I will. You're a realtor then suddenly you've eliminated scarcity and scarcity is your best friend because scarcity makes the values flesh out from those trade-offs. So when people start playing with monopoly money and they're like, oh, but I will do this, I will do that, I will get my paycheck in five days, they are avoiding the question of what should this money do given my real priorities. So those variable income earners, they just need to recognize that they still only deal with money they have on hand. They just have to be answering the question of what should this money do, do before I'm paid again? And I might not be paid again for a really long time. So it should do a lot more of the responsible conservative things like cover rent, cover food, cover gas for the car. And you should be much less inclined to do the more optional things. Once you've funded those out for a few months, three, four months, you've got rent covered literally in YNAB. You're like, I dropped... 1800 bucks in rent in March, April, May, and June. At that point, you could say, okay, I'm, I'm feeling really confident. Again, it's one of those things where you got to kind of gauge it, but the more volatile your income is, the more into the future you need to be budgeting your current money. And at that point, you can start to get a feel for it. Do not, under any circumstances, assume you will have money in a few days and avoid the question of, I'm out of money what are my priorities? That That's the magic. Now, uh, Jonathan, to your other point about the can of corn, uh, this, my, this is the key. You know how people always will say, live within your means, live within your means. And it's almost like overdone. That is the most important principle. And the means change and living can even change along with it. I live far better, like lifestyle wise, than I did a decade ago. And maybe in another decade, it'll be even better. Who, who knows? 
but li- I'm okay with lifestyle going up. Um, the means have to be going up right along with it. But when someone is saying, I'm able to scrape together 500 bucks a month, then your opportunity is the gap that you've created that has that $500. And when someone comes along and says, hey, we've got this apartment building for you to invest in, and we just need everyone to jump in with $3 million, well, that's, that's not your opportunity. But like me, I needed $350 a month. Had we not been living within our means, I would have needed, I don't know, $1,000, $2,000? Would, would I have even entertained the idea of launching YNAB if I thought I had to make $3,000 per month because Julie were li- you and I were living like our parents? You know, we were, we were living within meager means. And so I saw an opportunity that was $350 a month sized. And it was a perfect fit for us. Now I can see an opportunity that might be, I don't know, like the 80 grand that I blew on some software. I had an $80,000 opportunity. I blew it, but still the opportunity was there. A lot of people come on, they're like, I don't see opportunities. I don't ever get opportunities. Your opportunities are only ever going to be sized by the difference between what you earn and what you spend. So when you have that opportunity to get into a rental or whatever, you're not, you're looking at one size. That's it. People need to think more about that as an opportunity gap. And like, this is the size of your opportunity and less about, oh, I just got to do this because some personal finance guy says I should. The size of that is the size of opportunities you will recognize and be able to jump on. And, and I've seen that play out in my life over and over and over again. If it weren't for that gap, none of this would happen. And this I is just, why we don't have 15 you know, minute episodes, Brad. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, incredible. Yeah. All right. Wow. Jesse, you have brought it and I, there's so much value here. I think this is one our audience is going to be listening to a second time and sharing with a friend or family member. Uh, on most shows, that would be the end of the episode. But on this show, we would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? I, I am ready. I, I don't know. Am I ready? I, I'm feeling <laughs> the fear. I'm ready. Fear setting in. Yes, I feel fear. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, these questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, Jesse, what is your favorite blog, podcast, or book of all time? Favorite book is Deep Work by Cal Newport. Yeah, I, I, that, that book is so good. It's just awesome. Let me, uh, that book is on my reading list. And then I had a bunch of other books that had time that I was forced to read sooner and it got bumped down. And so it's still on my reading list. Like what was the, what was the, the big idea you took away as we see technology do what it's doing and inter- and interruptions become more and more of an issue and think about this with your kids maybe as well um it is a competitive advantage if you know how to uh, do deep work where you think hard about something you stay focused for a long time on something and you're comfortable in that space that's kind of that's what i took from from newport's book was that is a competitive edge. And so I promote, if, you, if you're hired at YNAB, we send you that book. We say, get used to this. Get used to Slack not being quite so lively as at other companies. I love that we have people that can just dig into something. That's, that's how everything that's great has ever been made, is people doing deep, deep work. I love that. Question number two, an inflection point in your life that was especially memorable or meaningful? Here's one that's funny as well. Uh, I had put a note card in my wallet when I was 25 that said I wanted to pay off my house before I was 30. At this time, YNAB was a side gig. I was working as an accountant for 48 grand a year. And, uh, that lasted for 10 months. I didn't, I didn't last long, (laughs) but, um, I set a goal to pay off the house before you're 30. I didn't own a house. We bought the house later and I just got crazy about paying that off. And, uh, there was a point where I had to pay the IRS or I had to pay off the house and finish it. And I actually, uh, paid off the house. <laughs> and then I just got on a payment. I got on a, on an informal payment plan with the IRS. It was like 30 grand that I owed him. 
and uh, it was a poor, poor estimation of taxes. You know? and, oh, in the IRS uh, so, 30 grand, that's not scary at all. Yeah. Is, is this yeah. why and you're so an I, accountant for 10 months, Jesse? <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I was on the audit side, which was even worse. I, I did not have good, a good accountant back then. I, I'll be honest, I have a good one now, but, um, but I just pay, I just sent them money as I got it over the next four or five months. And I never heard from them is a non-issue, but it was an inflection point for me because I was sitting there with two very interesting priorities, but had I not paid off the house, I it was, I was 29 and 30 was coming up and I just said, no, you said you would do this. So come what may pay the IRS people. That is the lesson here. <laughs> but um, that's what I heard. <laughs> yeah. But I, I didn't, I enjoyed the goal along the way and I liked that it was audacious for, for us. And I was amazed that it actually happened. It was like things started falling in our lap. Uh, uh, it was so never underestimate an audacious goal that you really, truly obsess over. Wow. That is really, really cool. All right, Jesse, question number three. I suspect there's an easy answer here. Your favorite life hack. Oh, don't go with the easy no. answer. Come on, scale <laughs> up. <laughs> oh, man. Favorite. You know, I don't even like the word life hack, probably. Oh, I um, love it. Someone that takes a stand. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, gosh, I, I I think if you work out first thing in the morning, it makes the day better. Nice. Love it. Yeah. So you've split tested that with uh, other times a day? I have. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I For about two years, I worked out at 9.30 a.m., and it bled too much into everything else. Mm. Uh, just didn't work. So I'm, I'm back to the 5.30 to 6.30. And yeah, I like it. I like it quite well, a bit. Well, with five kids, I mean, I can see a strategic advantage to, to having that there, done. Yeah. <laughs> like sneak out the door. <laughs> like everything's dark. Brad Barrett before quiet. 7 a.m., yeah. he has to creep down the stairs. <laughs> I, I understand. Uh, okay. Question number four. The biggest financial mistake you have made. Like biggest financial mistake. So, uh, yeah, we bought a house, our first house, the one that I paid off. Um, we, we bought it in June of 2008. So you can do the rest of your, you know, the math on that one, but, uh, that didn't go very well for many, many, many years afterward. So, um, yeah, financially, that one wasn't as hard as the blow on the money. Here, here, no, this one's bigger. The the money that I spent uh, and lost on software that we ended up, I mean, I had nothing to show for it afterward. Um, that was well. Let me ask you a question about that. Let me because you scrapped it. You walked away. So you know, right now we're recording this in November, and SoftBank just plunged another you know, billion plus dollars into rescuing WeWork right now. Like they're like, no, we're going to salvage this at all costs. Like on a smaller scale, like 80,000 meant way, way more to you than that money, you know, means to them. And you were able to walk away. And, and I'm curious, like, like for you, like, was it because it just legitimately didn't work? Was it be, like, what was the, what allowed you to actually step away and say, no, I've already dropped 80 grand. I got to drop, I got to find investors for another hundred and fix this. Yeah, we, um, we, I mean, we're bootstrapped. So it's always, it's always been my money. And Taylor, uh, was on an, on a hiatus. He'd been working part-time for me. We'd released two versions. No, we'd worst, we released the first version of the software, but he was like, I got to bow out for a while. So he did. And I found someone else that was not nearly as great as Taylor. And that guy, I didn't do due diligence. Um, I had inklings and didn't respect them in my gut. Right. Um, I got in deep wasted tons of time and the 80 grand. And then Taylor came on full time and he came on about a month before we were going to go live with this software that was going to be the next version of YNAB. And, uh, Taylor sees it and he just said, man, this is, this is not good. This is horrible. And it would have really tarnished our brand. Uh, it would have really sent us on a horrible trajectory with our customers. And back then we were far, far smaller. This would have been 2008. We were very small, but it would have hurt us really bad. And I am glad that um, Taylor could come to me and say, hey, I know you spent this money, but I don't want to do this. I don't think it'd be a good idea. And I am very glad that he saw in me, um, luckily, my, my prioritization of brand long-term view versus short-term view, man, that could have furnished our house. You know what I mean? And um, I feel like I won some points with him early on. And he's, he's been a fantastic business partner for the past 10 plus years. Uh, and so I felt like that put us on a partnership trajectory that was far more valuable than the 80 grand lost. But, 
you know, in the moment, still painful, but you look back and lessons learned, right? Yeah, that's incredible. Because I mean, for most people, psychologically, throwing good money after bad, I mean, that happens more often. Yeah, sunk costs. Right, right. I mean, that money was gone. As you said, sunk costs. It's not getting it back. We need to make a decision based on the facts on the ground today. So yeah, kudos to you guys. All right, Jesse, question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. This is a bit of a, this is a little self-promotional, but uh, I missed out on opportunities. If I would have been budgeting the business money with YNAB, using those four rules, I would have been far less risk averse and I would have had far more clarity on growing it and growing it faster. I would look at the checking account balance and be like, can we hire? Can we not? You can't make a decision that way. Um, I thought you had to use QuickBooks if you were being like grown up, you know, and if it was a real business, it needed to be on QuickBooks or something else serious. I never thought that I could run a cash-based business on YNAB, which is totally cash-based. It's shameful that I didn't think of it. But when I ran, I started running YNAB on YNAB, uh, suddenly I could see all my priorities. I could see my strategy delineated across my checking account. And suddenly we could start hiring. And uh, from that point on, it really was an inflection point for us. Because I, I recognized that I was actually being dumb holding on to that much money and not putting it back in, in, in what was looking like a really good investment. All right, all right. I, I was going to let this question go, but since you've now teed it up for me, let's talk about this. So YNAP for business owners, like I know this is something that you flirted with. So you ran YNAP, YNAP on YNAB. You stopped running YNAB on YNAB. Like run, you know, just talk about this. What you just said, I think is the setup, like the mindset's there. What would a business owner that wants to think about giving every dollar job and wants to start thinking about, would this work on YNAB? Like, what are the considerations and what are you grappling with going forward? Because your business has gotten a lot more complicated. It has. Yeah, we have to do accrual accounting now, which is is, uh, is another way of saying more complicated accounting. And um, and so uh, YNAB is, is cash focused. It, it cares only about cash. And uh, if you have a business that has lots of receivables, those are not cash. If you have a business that has uh, tons of capital, um, I, I should say working capital like inventory, that's not cash. You would find YNAB lacking. But if you're a business that just deals in cash, you're you know you you do hair, uh, you're a realtor, you um, uh, you know you detail cars, you'll find that it's it works flawlessly. And the the what I like about it is you can look at someone's budget. And you can say, uh, what's your strategy? And they're like, well, I don't know. And it starts to get these questions going with, well, do you want to invest in advertising? Do you want to uh, work on hiring someone? Like where the money goes is, is what the strategy is. And YNAB just makes it readily apparent for you what it is. And it also gives you a really nice benefit of being able to see when you could maybe start taking that regular pay. Uh, that personally is is more reliable and just kind of makes the personal life a little little easier to handle. So um, I would encourage anyone that has pretty simple finances, just give it a stab. You know, take your big balance in your business, drop it into YNAB, and start playing with uh, allocating that money. What should this money do for my business before I bring in new money, and uh, see what happens. But it it was it was meaningful for for us. We started hiring because I realized we had money there that was going untapped. All right, Jesse, we got a bonus question for you. Now, what purchase have you made over the past 12 months that has added the most value to your life? My table saw. Oh, yeah. right, now you're a woodworker Absolutely. too? Is that, tell me a little more I'm a, here. I'm a horrible work, woodworker. I'm a budding woodworker. Budding. Um, what did the first project look budding. like? Uh, it was leaning, you know? <laughs> like nothing was, Coffee table? Nothing, yeah, nothing was square. It was this little table that we have out on the back. Uh, it's ugly and- uh, but it was the first one, you know, and I made cutting boards for people last Christmas. Um, that's one thing that's, you know, that it's much more fun to, uh, there's more on the line when you're making somebody something than just buying them something. So, uh, but yeah, the table saw it's, it's cast iron, it's a saw stop. So if it ever senses something conductive like flesh, the brake explodes, the, the, the blade drops down and your what would have been a, a, a missing thumb is now a, a nick on your thumb. You can see YouTube videos of it. It's crazy. But it's cast iron table, it's perfectly level, perfectly smooth, perfectly 90 degrees with the blade. Um, awesome dust collection. It's Yeah, it's changing my life in the shop. So that's like 
Yeah, I can't get enough of it. I just like looking at it. It's so pretty, you know? So <laughs> last 12 months. Oh, Jesse. Definitely the tables. I think Jonathan is already clicking buy on Amazon as we speak. Stop it. <laughs> Calm down, sir. Calm down. <laughs> oh my goodness. Jesse, this has been a blast. I think you know how much we appreciated putting this episode together with you. And I think our audience will as well. I tell you what, for people listening to this, maybe they just want to get started with YNAB. Maybe they want to find out more about uh, you and the community. What is the best way for them to do that? Yeah, you need a budget.com, YNAB if you're in a hurry. You can both go to the same place. Um, I'm not really on social media. I don't do Twitter anymore. I don't do, you know, do Instagram you're or Facebook. Out. But yeah, I'm not, I can tell. <laughs> not you know, so much. If not you read so deep work, if yeah, if you read deep work, you'll be like, wait a minute, you know. So um I backed out of that stuff a while, a while ago. But it, people can always email me. It's Jesse at YNAB.com if they have specific questions. Um, and we also have a killer support team uh that just I mean, they're better than I am at answering any question. Uh, and then we have a really great Reddit, like a subreddit that uh, people go to for questions. And you know how Reddit is, they'll tell you what they think. And so you'll get the straight, you know, you get the straight shooters over there that I think are really valuable. So we're all over the place. I, I do podcasts as well. If you want this voice, uh, you know, for three or four minutes every Monday, that's where you get that. Um, just don't be creepy and binge listen all eight years, you know, like that's just a little creepy. So all right. That's all Avoid I the creep. I hear you. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jesse, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. This has been a blast. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. You know, Brad, I think Jesse really provided us a roadmap. I mean, yes, talking about a budget, I hear you, but at the heart of it, I mean, it's communication, man. It's really getting that spouse, that partner on board and really aligning. What did he say? Align your money with your values, with your goals, and let that be your guiding light. This is not about deprivation. I love the continuity of what Je Jesse brought to this episode. Yeah, agreed. And unleash your creativity. What a great quote that was. I just, I love that concept of, okay, there may be constraints here, but let's be creative. So yeah, I mean, this is an episode, Jonathan, honestly, I'm going to listen to a couple of times. There were just gem after gem. So yeah, a huge thanks to Jesse. All right, my friends, you made it to the end. Like, comment, subscribe. Thanks for being here on YouTube. It's a lot of fun to bring these interviews to you in this video format, and we hope you will continue to join us as we go down the road less traveled.